All right. Well, church, we are at the end now of Romans chapter 8. In fact, we've worked our way through the first half of the book of Romans, and these are our final two verses. Uh, we've got them in before the year is out. Praise the Lord, and uh, it's great to be able to share these with you uh, today. I'm just going to read these two verses, and then uh, uh, we're going to have a look at what these uh, bring to a close for us today. Romans chapter 8, we are looking at verses 38 and 39. Romans 8, 38 through 39, which says, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is God's word to us today. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you for this journey through the first, chap uh, the first eight chapters of the book of Romans. Lord, we thank you for all that you have taught us and are teaching us. And as we land upon these verses today, Lord, I pray that they do, our, they do their work deep in our hearts, that we might be changed by the understanding of these verses, that these might be verses that we cling tightly to in all seasons of life, knowing of your great love for us. Help us to be hearers of your word today. And Lord, would you help me to preach your word faithfully to the scriptures? Uh, may I decrease and you increase. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Last week I was uh, using what you would call a, a metaphor that theologians have used for a long time in regards to Romans 8, that the journey is like that of a, a mountain hike going up a mountain. It fits particularly well as we, as we consider this uh, because we have trekked together. There has been a journey that we have taken through the scriptures. Uh, we have hiked. We have even stumbled a few times, but we've always got back up. We went into some valleys and considered the depths of our sin. But we made it through these and we continued this climb, this great hike towards a deeper understanding of God's love for his people. And now as we arrive at these final two verses, just like we did last week, it's a moment to reflect on the glorious view of our salvation. Time to take in the view and, and soak it in, so to speak. All that God has been showing us through Romans this far enables us to now arrive with Paul to be able to say that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. We have done this journey and now we are doing these final two verses to really take in and behold the sovereignty of our God and his great love for us. If we consider how Christians love to speak of the love of God, we love to share the love that God has, we present God to others as a loving God. Our desire for them is then not just to hear this news but to know individually and personally as well the love of this great God, knowing that God does in fact show mercy to so many people, even though human beings do not deserve the mercy that he gives to us. But I want you to think about Bible study just for a moment. I want you to think about the way in which we have a tendency to take a collection of verses that we really like, we have a, a tendency to even maybe have a list of particular verses that we love at a time in life that we might need those verses. There is nothing wrong with having such a list as this, to have your, your favourite verses kind of up the sleeve or stored in your heart that you might be able to recite them at different times. I remember seeing uh, pages that you could print off from the internet that might speak of, here are some verses that speak of um, God's love for you to remind you those things are good yet you will not know the depth of God's love if you only have those two verses you will not know how great a love God has for his people if you've just cut those two verses out so to speak and hung on to them because the wording is familiar and easy for us it's a little bit like this if you imagine 
coming into a, a movie or a TV series that you, that you have been told is really great? Do you come into the movie and go, look, what I think I'll do is I'll just jump forward and catch the final scene of the movie. Now, in doing so, you might get to understand a little bit of what's going on. You might even get the big action sequence at the end and go, wow, this has been really great. But you will not appreciate that final scene as much as the person who has actually journeyed all the way through the story, hearing about how the characters were developed and the plot growing like this. It'd be a bit like also grabbing a novel of a story that you might like and jumping to the final chapter, missing all of the context that came before it. And likewise, when we consider these two verses today, yes, you can take a hold of them and you can remember them and recite them, but they're going to mean so much more to you if you have journeyed with all of those verses that we've got to as we come here. So if you are just joining us today, there will be encouragement to you from these verses for sure, but I'd love to encourage you to go back and read Romans 8. See how it is that we can make this conclusion with Paul that there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. And I promise you, it will mean so much more to you if you grab all of the chapter in its context. In fact, all of Romans that have come before us. And Paul is asking the question here to expose whether there is anything that could come against us. This is what he's been doing for these previous verses. He's been uh, are taking us through, is there anything that can separate you from the love of God? And having dealt with these last week, Paul arrives at this conclusion that he is sure of, and he says these words, he says, for I am sure. I am sure. Means that he is certain. The thing that's about to come next that he is going to tell you, he is not just hopeful about it. He's not just going to say it because it sounds good and maybe it'll encourage you a little bit. He speaks with certainty. There's an authority in this proclamation, this statement, that he says, there is no more wondering. There is no more questioning. He says, I am sure. And he is certain and is able to make this conclusion that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And it is the same certainty that I want each believer to be able to take a hold of today of your salvation. Now, of course, we as Christians are called to examine ourselves from time to time and make sure that we are in the faith. This is not ever, uh, I said a prayer once and then I live however. We're never saying that. We are knowing that if you are a true believer, there will be fruit that will come from your life. But God speaks a word of certainty to his people. He does not leave you wondering whether you will be with him in eternity. He is not like the false religions that we have around us where they say to you, if you be good enough, you might get into heaven. That is not our God, friends. And he gives to you today a word of certainty. He says, I am sure that there is nothing that is going to separate you. This is a, a conclusion to this, to this great hike that we have been on. But Paul now wants to make sure you really get this. He wants to examine a few more things before he brings this to a close, just to make sure you understand the certainty that there is in Jesus Christ. And he says this, neither death nor life. We're talking about things that might be able to separate you from God's love. And he says, neither death nor life. Every single one of us, has death ahead of us yet. We can say that together with complete confidence, although it sounds a little morbid, but we can say with confidence, we will die. You will die, I will die. However, in Paul's message, we read that this death that is yet ahead of us is not able to remove you from God's love. The thing that people fear so much, death itself, cannot remove you from God's love. People fear death. I remember hearing the, the great R.C. Sproul talk about death as he was getting close to the end of his life. And he says, I don't fear death, but I do have concerns about the process because I don't like pain. We can probably all relate to that. None of us really like pain. But just like he's saying here, the person who is in Christ, they do not fear death itself. We have no fear of it. 
And these are the types of scriptures that we are to know and store up as we consider death that is before us. Why does death not bring fear to us? Because death cannot defeat you because Christ has conquered death through his death and his resurrection. And in fact, the doorway to eternal life is death. In fact, it's something for the Christian to look forward to. It is when we talk about life and death, I like to reverse those words, death and life. Because it's not though we are working our way up to the end of all things. We are heading towards eternity. We are heading towards life. To say to anyone in this room today who is not in Christ, if you have not come to the place of surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, death is your enemy still. Death is not an enemy of the believer because Jesus has united the believer to himself, conquering death. But the person who is still rebelling against God despite hearing the gospel Death is not just a natural part of life that you have ahead of you. If you are not a believer, death is to be feared because this is the time where you will stand before God and give an account for your life. And if you die without Christ, you are dying without his covering of your sin. You are dying without having been united to his resurrection and the punishment that does await you is eternal damnation in hell. And I say that not today as a scare tactic to you. I say it because I love you and I care for the state of your eternal soul. And so I proclaim to you, if you have not yet come to Christ, what you need to do is believe upon the Lord Jesus for salvation, that he died for your sins and was raised to life, overcoming death. And in doing so, the very promise that I speak of today will be yours, friend. Christ died for sinners, was raised up. It is for this reason that if you, if you give yourself over to Christ's calling, as you hear the call of the Lord, you will indeed be saved. I was telling this to a young man once. I was having this conversation with him about life and death and about salvation. And I said, what will you do then? Rejecting God again and again, what will you do when you stand before him to give an account for your life. And this young man said, oh, I don't know, I, I guess I will repent then. I said, you guess? You're leaving the state of your soul, your eternal soul down to a guess? I said, friend, it will be too late for you then. Today is the day of salvation. The call of the Lord is upon you today. You are not promised tomorrow. Once you're dead, that opportunity for repenting of your sin and turning to Christ is gone. And so I call today, trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. Because death cannot separate the person in Christ from the love of God for eternity. Amen? For Christians, there is a further implication of this truth that death cannot separate us from the love of God. Maybe you're like me living here in the West, but from every once in a while, you hear a story of a martyr. You hear the story of those brave brothers and sisters in faith who, whether in, in past, in history, or whether even today, have been put in a situation where they were told to deny Christ or you will lose your life. It's not a, it's not a nice situation to, to, to picture in our minds, but I'm sure... Like me, you've wondered, how would you go in such a situation? Pretty much none of us here, I'm sure, will ever be in this situation, but we've probably thought, how would I go if somebody was threatening my life and just said, all you need to do is deny Christ? For many Christians, this is a very real, uh, it's a reality of life for them. How would you go? And what I want you to know that in this passage, you can take encouragement and certainty that not even such a situation can remove you from the love of God for you. We do not fear man and what he might do to the body because we will be with Christ forever. To live is to live for Christ, to live is Christ, but to die is in fact gain. And as we consider the martyrs throughout history of the Christian church, their deaths have in fact 
propelled the church forward, strengthened the church and grown the church throughout history. Death has no sting. Yet Paul adds to this. He says, life itself cannot separate you. We think that's, that's an interesting uh, uh, word that Paul is using here. To, he's doing this contrast of death and of life. But we've been studying previous verses that talked about the reality that life will bring you trials and suffering. Some of you are in those trials even right now. Some of you have got trials that you've just come out of and you know that there will be trials ahead because there always is. And friend, here today, that life and its trials and whatever this life brings to you cannot separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Paul says, nor angels, nor rulers. Angels are God's messengers. Hebrews first, uh, chapter 1 Verse 14 speaks of angels saying that they are ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. But we also know that there are angels who fell from grace. Considering angels then, whatever their standing with God, whatever their position, regardless of the power that they have been given, they are not powerful enough to separate you from the love of God. Paul says rulers cannot separate you from the love of God. And so it would be right to conclude here that Paul has the government in mind when he says that rulers cannot separate you from the love of God. Nothing that a wicked ruler, a tyrannical government, a corrupt politician can do in this life can separate you from the love of God. That doesn't mean that we ignore the issues of our day. We do actively oppose where there is injustice. We are to be a pillar of truth in this world and to speak for those who are not able to speak, but we are not to have any fear of rulers of government. Amen? Have no fear of them, the scriptures declare. And this is a good reminder for us today, particularly for those of us who do see the state of our world at the moment and wonder what lies ahead. And it is right to have those kind of questions in our heart and in our mind as we consider what will take place in the next 10 years. What will the next 20 years be like in this country? Whatever it is, you are to have no fear of it. If you are in Christ, nothing that the future brings, nothing that any of these rulers do can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Not with a God like what we have. Not with a God who is mighty and sovereign over all of this world. Paul says, nor things present, nor things to come. There is nothing of now in this life that can take you away. There is nothing to come around the corner. And so from this, I I encourage you today to take great comfort in the reality of these verses. There is no powers, Paul says. Now, if you're using the New King James Version you might see the wording principalities and powers. Uh, Some translations will will have have a different phrasing here. It It refers to Satan and his demons. God through Paul is saying here that Satan and his demons cannot separate you from the love of God. Do you believe that today? As a Christian who rightly has some concerns about evil in the world. Do you believe what the scripture has just spoken to you today, that Satan himself cannot remove you from the love of God? Let me say something on on Satan and demons just here for a moment. Christians can often fall into two errors when it comes to Satan. Either some Christians will give Satan way too much credit, Some Christians will think way too highly of the power that Satan has. To the the degree that you will see Satan in anything that is going wrong in your day. I've seen Christians blaming Satan for a laptop not working well. I've seen Satan Satan accused of the traffic incident, uh, blocking up the traffic and causing someone to get home 10 minutes later than what they would have previously. Now, we should know that Satan has power and that he is a deceiver to be watched out for. But are we focused on demons and Satan and the power they have? Or are you focused on Jesus Christ who has all power 
over all of this. Satan is anything but a mutt on a chain used for the purposes of God, restrained to bring about God's purposes. I think we have a tendency sometimes to love the darkness still more than we love the light. Particularly if we've spent a lot of time in the world, we've, we've known the darkness, we, we feel comfortable in the darkness and coming into the light of God's kingdom can be a bit bright and overbearing at times. But friend, I encourage you, put your heart and your trust towards Jesus Christ who is sovereign. Jesus Christ who has not, not just some power, but all power. On the other hand though, that's one extreme. On the other hand, there are people who are asleep to Satan, not watchful. The reality is he does seek to deceive and to cause harm. So the point should be that we wouldn't be asleep to him, that we are watchful. We are aware of the fallen state of the world. We are aware of the evil and we pray against these things and we protect. But cement your faith and your trust in God. He, nothing can, be, can remove you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Paul then moves, if you follow me in the wording, he's, he's dealing with all these different things, isn't he? He's going to life and death. He's going to angels. He's going to present realities in time, things of the future. And then he says with this great illustration, there's no height and there's no depth that can separate you. I think this is, I love this illustration because it really does exhaust all possibilities of things that could separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so what are we building here? We are are upon this glorious view, this reality of the security and the confidence that we have in our God. That what God began in you from before the foundation of the world, he will complete. He will finish. He will bring this salvation, glorification, complete for you who are in Christ Jesus. Now I want you to picture with me for a moment that we've we've journeyed up this mountain, we've exhausted these possibilities where we're looking at, well, maybe this could separate me. And we've said, no, look, Paul has said here, that thing couldn't separate you either. Maybe Satan will separate. No, Paul has said that this can't even separate you from the love of God. Now picture us as a group together looking at this glorious view, our eternal salvation, our security in Christ that we are safe in him, that he is the author, the perfecter of our faith. And we're all enjoying this view. And then someone in the crowd amongst us says, hang on a minute, what about yourself? Maybe you yourself could separate you from the love of God. And upon hearing this, we're all shocked for a moment. We're distracted from the the beautiful view that we are looking at. And we're going, oh no, maybe it is true. Maybe there is something that I could do myself to separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. To which we go, keep reading, friend. Come back to the text. It says, nor anything else in all creation. That's you, friend. You are part of God's creation and there is nothing in this creation that can separate you from God. Not your rebelliousness. You do not have the power against God's sovereignty. Jesus says, none can snatch you from my hand. He adds to this and he says, none can snatch you from my father's hand. Just to build upon this as well. He holds his people secure. But there would still be some among us who might think, hang on a minute. What if I get myself out of God's hand? What if I get myself out of Jesus' hand? Or I get myself out of the Father's hand? Friend, do you really think you have that kind of power? Do you really think you have it in you? Do you think you're more powerful than Satan? Do you think you're more powerful than God himself who says none can snatch, not even yourself? So if that's your thinking, friend, I want to say give that up. Not even you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And hear this in context with scripture today. God foreknew you, loved you, chose you from before the foundation of the world to be conformed to the image of Christ. The one who justifies you, 
the one who adopts you into his family, sanctifies you and glorifies you for your good. He is the one, as we read in Ephesians, who has sealed you with the promised Holy Spirit. He is not going anywhere. Take a look at that view again now, knowing that not even yourself can remove you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. The scriptures do not lie. The scriptures speak plain, simple truth to grow our security in him. Glance your eyes to the beginning of chapter 8. The chapter began with the words, no condemnation. There is therefore no condemnation for you who are in Christ Jesus. And now, as we arrive at the end of this chapter, it says that there is no separation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What a chapter, friends. Can you hear it? At the beginning, there is no condemnation for you. And at the end of it, there is no separation for you who are in Christ Jesus. So our great conclusion here today is we are to have a wealth of knowledge that comes to us about God's love for his people. There's always much work ongoing for God's people, but when we land on something like this, friend, I want you to take a moment to savour this, to ponder what we are looking at today. Think of some of the things that you have faced in life recently. Think of the, the battles and trials of our day and land upon the reality that there is no separation for you in Christ Jesus. Here's how I want to apply this today, looking at the text and to bring it home for you. The first thing that I really want you to understand is in the sovereignty of God, it is to grow your confidence in Christ. As we behold the sovereignty of God, his, his purposes of calling us to himself, his work using all things for your good for those who love you. I want you to walk forward now in life with a greater confidence in Christ than you had before. That you would have no fear of man. Are you hearing the context of these verses now? The great love of the Father for you. No man should be feared. If God is for us, who can be against us? No one and no thing. So when you pray now, I want to encourage you today to pray with confidence of a sovereign God who acts through the prayers of his saints. What an amazing reality that he is sovereign, yet his chosen method in this world is through our evangelism and through our prayer. Therefore, friend, pray with confidence. Do you pray for our salvation? Do you pray for our, our weekly gatherings? When you do, pray that people turn to Christ. You can expect salvation in the household of God as the word goes out that people will come to Christ. Pray confidently, friend. This is God's declared purposes for his people. The prayers are heard by God and he responds to them. When you evangelize and speak to your friends, when you talk to your family and you're in those moments where you just wonder, Lord, what will become of this person that I love so much? I've tried to tell them the gospel. And all I have seen from them is a turning away. The hope that you have is in a God who shows mercy despite their turning away. Our hope is in God who shows mercy to many sinners. You have a role to play. You cannot save your friends and your family. But your role is to pray for them and to speak the words of life to them. And when you have done this, friend, you have done your role as called by your sovereign God. Of your own salvation, have confidence in Christ. Are you somebody who from time to time doubts your salvation? And maybe you, you just kind of look at your own life at times and you go, could I, could I really be? I am a really wretched mess. If you only knew some of the thoughts that went through my head at times, friend, there is nothing that is going through your head that can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. True believers have security in him. When I talk about this security in God, again, I'm not talking about that, uh, that, that version of 
somebody who says that they're a Christian and then goes and lives a life that you know is not a Christian at all. I'm not talking about the one who says, yeah, I believe in God, I believe in the Bible, and then goes and just lives a life that shows no reflection of that reality whatsoever. That, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the born-again Christian who is committed to the household of God, who has shown in their life that they are in a process of change, that there is fruit that is coming from their life, although not as much as we would like at times, but you are turning again in repentance. Friend, take heart today the words of your God who says nothing can separate you from his love. You are not hoping for the best when it comes to the day of judgment. You walk forward with the covering of the Lordship of Christ. See, here's the thing. If it was up to you, if you were going to stand before God with a list of things to say, hopefully these things were enough to get me over the line. You know, if, if God comes at me about those sins, at least I'll be able to say, well, I've, I did help some people here and I, I even prayed a prayer once over there. Friend, if it was up to your list of good deeds, there is no hope for you whatsoever. But as you go before God, before you, as you go before the mercy seat of the Lord, you stand with the covering of the Lordship of Jesus Christ, declared by God himself righteous in Christ. It is not yourself who has declared you righteous it is your God, who by your union to him, the death of Jesus on the cross, the blood has been transferred, has, has covered your sins. And what your God sees of you now is the righteousness of Christ. The righteousness of Christ has been imputed to you, credited to your account. Your sin washed away, your sin covered by the blood of Jesus. Are you hearing me today? I want you to go away from these verses confident in Christ, secure in your salvation, examining yourself, of course, testing yourself, of course, but secure in your God. Final point for today is what about when you don't feel the love of God? You have these times where you might feel like, I don't really feel or sense the love of God at this particular time. Friend, here's what I want to remind you today. Truth does not come from your feelings. Truth comes from the word of God proclaimed. If we were to get truth from our feelings, this is what would take place. There would be a rising of assurance and then a decrease of assurance in our lives. If we were to look to our feelings to go, this is the place where I get truth, you will have various versions of truth throughout the week. But as you stand firm upon the truth of scripture, your feelings will be governed by the scriptures and what God says about you. So even when you don't feel the love of God, remember that your feelings deceive you at times Turn again to these very words today. Open up Romans 8 and sit upon these. Climb through these verses. Work your way through these things again to behold the great love that God has for you. And we recognize today that all of these promises, all of this is only accomplished through Jesus Christ our Lord. We can only hold on to these promises because of Jesus who gave up his life for us at the cross and Paul declares, finishes this chapter by saying, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The love of God comes to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Finish today with your mind upon Christ Jesus, your Lord. Why were some people baptized today? Because they were united to Christ Jesus, their Lord. Why did we sing and declare the goodness of God today? Because we know we are in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Why did we take time to sit and hear teaching to take truths home to our heart today? Because we are in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the preeminent one, the most important in all of this creation. He is the son of God who took on flesh, 
perfect and sinless in every way, yet was condemned as though he were a murderer. He was condemned as though he were an adulterer, a thief. He died a criminal's death willingly because he took your sin and my sin upon him at the cross. We have these promises affirmed to us that not even death could hold him down and nor will it hold you down. Do you hear this call of God upon your life today? Turn to him and trust in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for this journey through Romans so far. And in particular, Lord, we give you thanks for this amazing chapter where you speak truth of your great love for your people, for those who are called according to your purposes. We know that nothing can separate us now from the love of Christ Jesus because of what Jesus has done and declared and because of your call from the beginning of time, Lord, we give you praise today. May we rest. May we see the security that we have in Christ. We thank you for the gift of salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, church. We're going to sing to finish. Why don't you stand with us as we sing today.